Thanks. Thanks so much. Thanks, Alan, for the introduction. Thanks for inviting me and having me here. Thanks for thank the Mashan Center for such a great host and uh, supporting me so well in all of this. Uh, it's wonderful to be back uh, and see old friends and colleagues who I don't get to see very often. Uh, and that's, that's been very nice, and thank you all for, uh, for coming out to, to hear me. Um, one quick preamble. Uh, so I, I, I just published a book in November uh, called Dark Ghettos, uh, Injustice, Dissent, and Reform. Um, this uh, talk is not actually from the book. <laughs> uh, it's from another project that I'm doing on, uh, with a, a colleague, Brandon Terry, a political theorist at Harvard, on, on King's political philosophy. We collected a nice group of political philosophers and political theorists to contribute to a volume uh, that's supposed to be out uh, at least by the 50th anniversary of King's assassination, which would be uh, April 4th, 2018. So we hope for that to be out. And this, this talk is from, from that project. It is, however, related to the book project of Dark Ghettos. Um, in some ways, it could be thought of as a kind of you know, introduction to the introduction. Because <laughs> uh, in some ways, I'm trying to build on some things that uh, King is up to, uh, in addition to some things that Kenneth Clark, famous social psychologist, uh, is up to, who wrote a book in 1965 called Dark Ghetto. And so mine is a book, in some ways, is a, a tribute to him and meant to be building on things that he's doing. But I think. Fair to say also some things that, that King is doing in his work. <clears throat> <clears throat> so according to Martin, to Martin Luther King Jr., two developments marked the end of the first phase of the civil rights movement and the start of a new radical black freedom struggle. First was the passage of the Voting Rights Act, which President Johnson signed into law on August 6, 1965. And the second was the emergence of riots in black ghettos, particularly the extremely violent and destructive uprising that occurred uh, August 11th, 1965, or at least began there, uh, in the neighborhood of Watts. The black freedom movement, King insisted, must turn north to attack the problems of the ghetto. And as usual, King uh, backed up his words with action. So he moved with his family to a west side neighborhood in a ghetto of Chicago. The aims of the largely southern civil rights campaign were to end racist brutality, to abolish Jim Crow ordinances, to secure freedom of association, and to establish an effective right to vote. The Voting Rights Act brought to a close one phase of the civil rights struggle, namely the fight, as King would have it, for a minimally decent treatment for blacks. The new phase of the the new phase aims at the realization of substantive equality. We must, King argued, move beyond ending humiliation to ending poverty, preventing discrimination, abolishing labor exploitation, and creating equality. The two phases are meant to be understood as part of a long struggle uh, because racial justice and economic justice, King insisted, are inseparable twins. However, the second phase would be even more challenging than the first. Abolishing Jim Crow costs affluent whites very little. It mainly involved desegregating public spaces and allowing blacks to vote and to be elected to public office. Now, it did cost working class whites quite a lot because for uh, then they had to compete with blacks for jobs and promotions on fairer terms. But fully realizing economic justice would cost uh, even more advantage whites and so a King thought many were inclined to resist it. Abolishing poverty, ending involuntary unemployment, building affordable housing, providing quality education for all, it's going to cost money, uh, probably a lot of it. Um, and so uh, it's going to be much harder to achieve than desegregation. And King was clearly right about the difficult road that lied ahead for, here we sit, some 50 years later without these goals accomplished. So what I want to do in this lecture is Consider King's account of the injustices that ghettos represent. And in particular, I'm going to try to highlight his broader conception of economic justice. I'm going to try to explain uh, how he understood the problems of the ghetto and outline uh, both the activism and the policies that he thought were going to be needed to, to remedy these problems. 
And then sort of in, the, if you'd like, the philosophical heart of the, the talk, I'll delve a bit into the specific moral principles that he took to justify these practical prescriptions. And so part of the aim here, I'm very interested in the history of, of black political thought, and part of my aim here is to better understand just what kind of egalitarian King uh, was, and also to determine uh, whether he's best described as a socialist, as some uh, commentators have insisted. And I, I'll close uh, briefly by saying something about the relevance of his theory for understanding and combating contemporary ghetto poverty. Um, so so there, there's a handout that's mainly there to, to sort of help you to, to track where I, where I am. Sorry for that the font's so, so small. I hope that you can read that. Um, but it's mainly there just for, as an out, for outline purposes. So section two, social problems of the ghetto. So because of the enormous influence of the Moynihan Report, most post-civil rights discussions of ghettos take up the questions of, take up questions of black family life. So like Moynihan, King uh, offered a historically informed account of what he regarded as, if you like, the disintegration and disorganization, his words, of black families and ghettos. He emphasized the destructive role of slavery. He noted black families might have been able to repair themselves coming out of slavery, if newly free persons had not been, quote, thrown off to plantations, penniless, homeless, still largely in the territory of their enemies, and in the grip of fear, bewilderment, and aimlessness, unquote. After the Civil War, most blacks told the way in poverty for generations. Those who migrated north were contained in ghettos, which increased the challenge of adjusting to city life. Now, King conceded, uh, whether rightly or wrong, I won't say, um, that women have dominated black families in ghettos because he thought that they have had more ready access to education and employment than black men. Black women's wages remain low, however, as they were largely restricted to domestic service. Lack of marketable skills and racial discrimination kept blacks, both men and women, out of higher paying jobs and kept some from gaining employment altogether. Demoralized, many black fathers suffered low self-esteem. Sometimes they undermined their children's ambitions. Sometimes they, in frustration, might strike out violently against their wives or children. Such families, he thought, were fr fragile and sometimes dysfunctional. But at the root of their difficulties is punishing poverty, lack of opportunity to develop marketable skills, and humiliating forms of economic exploitation. Crime, too, is a serious problem in ghetto neighborhoods. While police harass and brutalize ghetto denizens, they make little effort to protect black residents from crime, King thought. Street crime is de facto permitted in ghetto areas, provided it doesn't threaten to spill over into white neighborhoods. And law-abiding residents live in fear of it. Because both mothers and fathers are forced to work so much, and often at night and sometimes a great distance from home, children are left playing unsupervised in streets where they are exposed to crime and vulnerable to the influence of sometimes unsavory characters. Housing in ghettos is inadequate, unhealthy, overcrowded, and dilapidated. Yet rents are still high, even for these appalling accommodations, and housing discrimination restricts blacks' housing options. Real estate brokers and white residents will allow only a few token blacks, if any, to reside in white neighborhoods where housing is more plentiful and of higher quality. When blacks do overcome barriers to entry, whites flee these neighborhoods. Therefore, blacks, with only a few exceptions, are forced to live in deeply disadvantaged and segregated neighborhoods, that is, in ghettos. Now, King argued that ghetto social problems are rooted in economic disadvantage, in particular in unemployment, low wages, and a restriction to menial labor. The resulting poverty and economic insecurity, he thought, undermines healthy family life and inhibits escape from decaying and dirty housing. Some of these economic disadvantages are caused by ongoing racial injustices. So here, um, what he has in mind are things like racial discrimination in employment, schools, housing. But some, he thought, were caused by past racial injustices, generations and, uh, of bondage under chattel slavery and subjugation under Jim Crow. But there are also general 
economic disadvantages that harm people of all races, though blacks are hurt disproportionately. For instance, some unemployment and underemployment is due to automation and plant relocation. Automation increases productivity, but in the absence of government intervention, tends to create massive unemployment as employers seek lower labor costs to raise their profits. So only a full employment economy, um, perhaps with some public sector uh, jobs if necessary, can offset the damage that's done to low-skilled workers through automation. So section three, get our rights, economic injustice. Now for King, the Watts riot and similar uh, urban uprisings were not just a challenge to his philosophy of nonviolent resistance. He thought that riot, riots signified economic injustice, uh, that they serve as a, a kind of lens for understanding the problems of the ghetto. As he tells us, quote, the explosion in Watts reminded us all that the northern ghettos are the prisons of forgotten men. So ghettos are, ghettos are combustible, where he says ra uh, rage replaces reason because their inhabitants have suffered many abuses over a long period, yet their voices of protest are often disregarded. The rioters would rather strike out, even in self-destructive ways, than continue to be ignored. In the Trumpet of Conscience, King identified five factors that explain ghetto riots. I'll mention them quickly. Uh, a white backlash that takes the form of resistance, racial equality, and hostility toward blacks that demand uh, justice. Discrimination across several domains of social life. High unemployment, uh, particularly uh, high unemployment among uh, black youth. Uh, blacks' disproportionate conscription into an unjust war in Vietnam. And finally, inadequate public services in black neighborhoods. But it's pretty clear that he thought unfair obstacles to acquiring good paying jobs, or really that's the most important factor, I think, from his point of view. As paths to economic mobility are closed off, cynicism inevitably sets in. The ubiquitous harassment and disrespect on the part of police officers makes this feeling of economic insecurity even more acute. Festering resentment turns to rage. Hope turns to despair. Now, King was convinced that the denizens of ghettos understood uh, the source of their plight. This is evident, he thought, in the fact that the damage done by black rioters was overwhelmingly done to property. There was little violence aimed at physically harming whites, King insisted. The deaths, of, the deaths and injuries that did occur, he thought, were mainly due to aggressive military and police action to repress uh, riots. Looting and the destruction of property are, he claimed, forms of protest directed at symbols of wealth and objects of need. So riots communicate a message, outrage over economic injustice. However, King, as an uncompromising opponent of political violence, morally opposed rioting as a mode of resistance nor did he think it would be an effective strategy. Yet he, he didn't think that when blacks riot in America's ghettos, the rioters all, uh, alone deserve blame. He thought whites share some responsibility for these explosions of black rage. The white majority doesn't hold the government accountable for changing conditions in disadvantaged black communities, but instead tends to direct its resentment and hostility toward black ghetto dwellers themselves. In fact, the crimes of white society, King argued, are even greater than the law-breaking of ghetto denizens. Welfare laws, rights to due process, building code regulations, employment laws, entitlement to educational opportunity, all these are violated when it comes to blacks. And it is this long-standing and pervasive lawlessness perpetrated by the broader public that has created and perpetuated ghettos. Here's King again. The slums are the handiwork of a vicious system of the, of the white society Negroes live in them, but they do not make them any more than a prisoner makes a prison. So the task then is to abolish the ghetto. And this is the next step in the black freedom struggle. And uh, it will require, King maintained, uh, if you like, an economic reconstruction. Uh, it necessitates, uh, necessitates a radical change in the structure of our society, he said. And the question is what practical measures from policy to activism 
uh, must be undertaken to affect these changes. And so let me sort of briefly consider King's proposals. So ghetto's not going to disappear unless aggressive actions are taken to address racial inequality and discrimination. Effective anti-discrimination measures are needed to deal with ongoing racial injustices. King also suggested that compensatory measures were required to, as he would put it, atone for past injustices and to remove inherited obstacles to equal opportunity. Blacks can't compete on fair terms in a market society unless these handicaps are repaired or in some way offset. Moreover, blacks can't escape poverty in the same way white European immigrants did in earlier periods because there are too few decent jobs for those with low skills and educational disadvantages. However, the unemployment problem at the heart of the ghetto can't be solved by race-conscious policies alone. What's needed is a full employment economy that makes a place for those with few skills and little education, but without exploiting these vulnerable workers and without relegating them to only menial jobs. And where do we go from here? It was 1967, King made several concrete policy proposals for creating a full employment economy that includes the ghetto poor. So he thought, ghetto, uh, he thought government should subsidize private companies that hire and train workers with limited education. He thought there should also be an expansion in public sector jobs and human services in particular for disadvantaged communities. And these jobs, he thought, should be reserved for people who, who lacked a college degree. He thought colleges should be open to and should develop a curriculum for those who in the past uh, might not have been very successful in school but want to try their hands at it again. And there has to be sort of special employment opportunities for the hardcore jobless. That is, these are people who, say, dropped out of the labor market altogether and have subsequently lost some of the necessary work habits to make them employable. King lamented the lack of a minimum wage that guarantees a decent standard of living, where I think decent here it means something like uh, material well-being consistent with dignity. I'll return to that in a second. So he argued for a guaranteed annual wage and adequate hourly minimum wage. So here I think what King has in mind uh, is that the minimum wage should be set so a full-time worker at that wage would have yearly earnings above an appropriate poverty line. He also insisted that all those who are willing to work should be guaranteed employment, even in the public sector, if necessary. When employment can't be secure for everyone who wants it, a decent income should be guaranteed to the unemployed and underemployed. Now, in some of his later uh, labor speeches and writings, some of these are now collected in a volume called All Labor Has Dignity, um, which is a great collection. Um, King advocated moving away from anti-poverty initiatives that focus exclusively on finding poor people jobs to ones that attack poverty directly by providing the necessary income. He asserted that just as each citizen has a constitutional right to vote, each should be constitutionally entitled to adequate housing, a quality education, and the income necessary to secure uh, basic necessities. A King's militant anti-poverty stance here led him to advocate for uh, what he called a, a Bill of Rights for the Disadvantaged. And it led him to denounce the inadequate funding for the war on poverty. Even more radically, he sometimes asserted that guaranteed income should be aimed at reducing economic inequality and not just at eliminating absolute poverty. So here he, he suggests a guaranteed basic income should be like he said, has it a, a, some percentage of median income right? and not solely sort of set to meet basic uh, uh, physical needs. The guaranteed income must, as he says, automatically increase as the total social income grows. Otherwise, those who receive it would suffer a relative decline over time. Now, this kind of position, it, it seems to me, um, suggests that King was concerned about more than just securing the basic necessities uh, for all, but uh, with everyone's relative standing right, um, uh, in society. So in other words, um, this is a proposal that rests on a, on, on a moral objection to inequality. To reduce racial discrimination in employment, King called not only for marches and demonstrations, but also for orga uh, organized and sustained economic boycotts of businesses that serve black customers but don't promote blacks, say, in, a, in a, uh, significant numbers sometimes called this Operation Breadbasket. 
uh, as a form of nonviolent direct action and he, that he thought could work in ghetto communities to affect a more just distribution of jobs and to increase black uh, employment. Now, King didn't think Operation Breadbasket is like, like a, a kind of extortion, right? Uh, uh, he thought, given that the injustice that blacks face, it is permissible, it's a permissible form of political dissent. Here I quote him again, basic to the philosophy of nonviolence is a refusal to cooperate with evil. There's nothing quite so effective as a refusal to cooperate economically with the forces and institutions which perpetuate evil in our communities, unquote. Now, he thought this same method could be used to improve housing conditions in ghettos. Black residents could uh, establish tenant unions or organize rent strikes to pressure landlords to make repairs and to offer uh, fair rents. And in this way, the methods forged to fight segregation in the South could be deployed to fight economic subjugation in the northern ghettos. Now, unlike many black power advocates who were generally skeptical of the mostly white labor movement, King himself called for a civil rights labor alliance. The problems of labor are also black problems because the vast majority of blacks are ordinary workers. Even as early as Stride Toward Freedom, it's published in 1958, King realized, quote, the poor white was exploited just as much as the Negro. The black freedom struggle and the labor movement have, he claimed, essentially the same concerns. Blacks must therefore join the labor movement and attempt to influence its demands. And together with workers of other races, blacks can create just economic conditions in America and perhaps elsewhere. Now, of course, for this to be a fruitful alliance, uh, the labor movement had to change in some ways. It did have to steadfastly oppose racial discrimination in employment and in unions, and union membership. It had to welcome blacks into the skilled trades, uh, making training available to everybody who saw promotion to hire uh, skilled positions rather than just say reserving uh, the most desirable roles for whites. And the movement had to, to really had to fight for all workers and, and not just for those who happen to belong to their unions or to labor organizations. Okay, so that's sort of like a, a quick sketch of the kind of activism and the policies he thought that were necessary. So now I want to kind of turn to like, well, why, why, why those? Uh, why those particular ones, right? And to try to I try to identify what I take to be the basic principles that underlie those prescriptions and try to think about what they, what they mean. Um, now, as is well known, King was a, a Christian minister. So many of his political views were rooted, at least in part, in theological commitments, uh, in particular in his reading of the gospel text. But he was also, uh, I think, a, a public philosopher who defended his political stances relying on secular, secular philosophical arguments. Um, I think he's fully aware that he had interlocutors who didn't share his religious convictions. And his arguments were not designed to convert them, say, to, to the Christian faith. Rather, I think in the spirit of sort of public deliberation and pluralist democracy, he sought to persuade his political opponents using principles that he thought uh, they could accept, even if they had rather different uh, religious beliefs or profess no religion at all. Now, I think some of these arguments um, have merit and import for uh, the problem of ghettos today. And I think that underlying King's practical recommendations are a set of moral principles that can justify these economic policies and social movement goals. Now, one of these, uh, one of the most basic I take uh, to King's overall conception of economic justice, uh, one he invoked frequently, is the following. No one should be forced to live in poverty while others live in luxury. Now, he thought that knowingly allowing some to live in poverty when one has enormous wealth exhibits a kind of callous indifference to the suffering of others, and so is morally wrong. But he also regarded this social circumstance as a, a threat to dignity, and so an injustice. So let me try to e explain what I think he's thinking here. So indifference to human suffering is it, obviously wrong. We don't really need principles of economic justice or any fancy theory to condemn it. Yet this kind of indifference, when it prevails among advantaged members of a society, he thought constituted a kind of indictment of the society itself. Such poverty is unnecessary given the resources and technology available. Given that economic impoverishment is gratuitous suffering, gratuitous suffering, 
the refusal of the affluent to share their wealth with the poor is not simply a matter of selfishness, but it reflects insufficient concern for their fellow human beings, many of whom are their fellow citizens. Demonstrates that some value profit and property, property more than they value persons. And so it's therefore a serious moral vice. So we focused for a moment just on um, the ghetto poor in the United States. King emphasized that black ghetto residents feel humiliated to be living in such squalor while just blocks away others, mostly white, are living lives of luxury and engaging in conspicuous consumption. While whites lack intimate knowledge of ghetto impoverishment, black ghetto dwellers are fully aware of the opulence that lies just beyond their reach. And he thought that this knowledge makes them miserable. Now, th this observation, um, if, if it's correct, I think it does, does explain a lot, but I think to be fully convincing, King would need to explain, uh, help us understand why these feelings of misery are rooted in, let's say, reasonable resentment as opposed to simple irrational envy. And it's not Im Im immediately clear why the claim of the poor to have their impoverishment ameliorated is made stronger by the fact that some have great wealth. You know, if dire threats to physical health and mental well-being can be remo removed without great sacrifice, surely such action should be taken. And perhaps King, uh, all King really has in mind here is that the opulence is a visible sign that society has the capacity to reduce poverty, it doesn't take appropriate action to address the problem. But is there more to this anti-poverty principle than this? And I, I think there, there might be. So King thought that the poor can't maintain their dignity, and here I think he means something like their sense of equal civic standing, in the presence of great wealth. Allowing one's fellow citizens to languish in poverty communicates to the poor that they lack inherent equal worth and he thought was therefore a kind of insult to them. Moreover, workers cannot sustain self-esteem and morale if their market position suggests their abilities are practically worthless to others in society. Poverty stigmatizes the jobless in a society that measures worth in terms of how much money each has or can earn. Dignity can be restored or maintained only if each is widely recognized as entitled to either a job or a minimum income. A sense of equal standing is going to be secure for everyone only when no one's basic worth is measured in terms of their labor market competitiveness. While he recognized right to basic income, he thought would establish these conditions. For what it does is it publicly conveys that everyone is entitled to live a decent life, even if the market won't reward their efforts with a living wage. We'll talk more about that later if you like. A second principle King relied on is this. Individuals should be equipped with adequate material means so they can take full advantage of their formal freedoms. While mere formal liberties provide some protection from these threats to dignity, they are of limited value, he thought, to those who possess them if these people are poor. The same holds true for formal opportunities. Even with discriminatory barriers removed, one can't move to, say, an integrated neighborhood without the money for rent or mortgage payments. Real freedom and opportunity, he thought, has to be accompanied by sufficient means to take advantage of them. Here's King again. Negroes must not only have the right to go into any establishment open to the public, but they must also be absorbed into our economic system in such a manner that they can afford to exercise that right. Now this principle rests on a distinction that King would make between uh, abstract right and a concrete right. So mere legal recognition of equal citizenship, even when that happens to be adequately enforced, is, he thought, not uh, sufficient for social justice. For it doesn't, at least not taken by itself, um, um, enable everyone to enjoy the privileges of equal citizenship. So abstract rights, though codified in law, say, still allow second-class citizenship. Now this all strikes me as basically correct. Um, 
I think King perhaps could have made somewhat more of the fact that the value of the rights some possess is substantially greater because they have considerably more resources than others, which enables them to exercise these rights uh, more effectively, and it allows them to exercise them across a, a range of social domains. Um, just to emphasize that kind of inequity, I think uh, a kind of, I don't know, a kind of civic unfairness, uh, I think would be able to, he would then be able to connect uh, it to, to equality, to connect equality, as I said, that's a kind of democratic value with liberty and opportunity in a way I think he would, would like to. King comes closer to explicitly egalitarian concerns when discussing employment compensation. Um, here, uh, uh, unfortunately, the principle is somewhat vague. Uh, he's, it's something like this. The fruits of labor should be shared equitably with labor and capital on equal footing. So it's, it's somewhat difficult to discern the pr precise parameters of this principle or to determine exactly what it might mean in practice. Um, we would need, at a minimum, some kind of a, a counter to normative source of property rights, and we need some idea what the relative weight of such rights are, uh, and I don't think King, so far as I know, really provides that. So without that, I think we don't quite have a, a fully usable standard for deciding um, what constitutes a fair wage or a fair profit margin. We do know, relying on King's first two principles, that full-time workers should not be paid poverty-level wages. As he says, labor needs a, a wage labor bill, which puts a firm floor under wage scales. But that, of course, is compatible with capital taking the lion's share of the benefits of economic cooperation. So it doesn't really help us understand what the call for uh, e equity here uh, comes to. Indeed, as I discussed just a bit earlier, uh, King thought everyone was entitled to basic necessities, whether or not they were employed or owned capital. Recall that King emphasized the importance of building and strengthening labor organizations. So one might conclude that fair employment compensation is a matter of union representatives uh, of whatever it is, union representatives and management uh, agree to when labor's right to organize is concrete, uses terms, rather than merely abstract. Perhaps the economic exploitation of workers is simply a matter of taking advantage of their weak bargaining position and blocking their attempts to strengthen it. Yet King makes it clear that the power of labor organizations is needed because the owners of capital do not operate from goodwill or from reciprocity, but solely from the motive of private economic gain. And he laments this single-minded focus on accruing profit. Increasing, bargaining power, the, increasing the bargaining power of unions, then, I think, is merely a concession to this political reality. It's like an effective means to acquire equitable compensation for workers, given that capitalists are inclined to withhold it. So I think he must have thought that there was some independent standard for workplace distributive justice, but it's not clear to me just what that standard is. We might gain some insight into King's overall conception of distributive justice uh, by considering a, a final principle, though. It goes something like this. Productivity gains should benefit all, not just the owners of capital. Now, as things now stand, uh, capitalist social organization, given how it to spur technological innovation, creates unemployment and underemployment. Joblessness, uh, though is often interpreted as uh, you know, laziness or perhaps a, a lack of ability when in fact he thought is simply a byproduct of our economic system and our increasing reliance on machines and production. The market demand for efficiency and low labor costs is going to push many into joblessness and to insecure employment. Um, and therefore into poverty. The purchasing power of the average worker has not kept pace with gains in productivity. And I think it's this situation that is meant to justify organizing labor so that workers can gain uh, the kind of bargaining power they need to get their share, what he thought would be their fair share, of the benefits of economic cooperation. I think he also thought that it justified guaranteeing basic income for those whose labor has become less useful as labor-saving technology has evolved. 
And it's also meant to justify creating public sector jobs when private sector employment is insufficient to meet the demands uh, for opportunities to make a positive, useful contribution to one's society. And finally, I think he, he thought it justified dramatically expanding leisure time for working people as technology reduces the need for, for burdensome and unrewarding labor. King argued that while technology is the product of human labor, imagination, intelligence, ingenuity, and so should be something everybody can be proud of, uh, within a capitalist, uh, capitalist economy, it can also be a, a tyrannical and frightening force in the lives of everyday working people. And so he thought it needed to be subordinated to democratic will and used to promote human welfare and not utilized solely for profit or war. Just something quickly about how he thought about communism and capitalism in order to kind of situate what I want to say about how his relationship to socialism before I close. Um, so it was like much to the disappointment of his sort of a revolutionary black nationalist critics, King, King never, as far as I can see, advocated to overthrow liberal capitalist regimes. Nevertheless, uh, I, I would regard him, I should say, as a, a, a kind of radical when it comes to economic justice. Uh, to achieve economic justice, King thought there had to be what he called a revolution of values, and this revolution must ultimately transcend the values of both capitalism, or classical liberalism, might be way to put it, um, and communism, or Marxism. As he says, quote, the good and just society is neither the thesis of capitalism nor the antithesis of communism, but a socially conscious democracy which reconciles the truths of individualism and collectivism. King's pretty consistent throughout his writings from his earliest things to his late things about how he thought about communism. Um, for instance, he, he regarded Marxists as more relativists. He thought that communist, uh, communism denies that there are universal and absolute moral principles. Um, King didn't accept this kind of moral relativism, but instead thought of things like justice and peace as uh, fundamental, trans-historical uh, uh, values of the highest importance. Communists also advocated revolutionary violence, or at least uh, tended to hold that political violence is sometimes necessary and permissible. King rejected the idea that good ends can justify violence or deceit as means. So he would sometimes say means represent the ideal in the making and the end in progress. Communists also oppose liberalism. They deny the value of individual liberty, treating individuals as mere instruments to revolutionary change. Communism values the state and the ideal of a class of society above the individual and above personal autonomy. Though communists believe the state will eventually become obsolete in the socialist utopia, in the meantime, individuals are regarded as mere means to abolish capitalism with no claim to any liberties that might interfere with the success of this revolutionary project or that might slow the progress toward a classless society. Regarding totalitarianism as uh, an acceptable political expedient in revolutionary times, communists don't recognize basic political liberties as human rights. King maintained with other liberal thinkers that individuals have inherent and inalienable rights, including a claim to participate in collective self-governance as equals, freedom, here uh, understood as a capacity for rational deliberation and choice, is, a, is the very thing he thought that gave us dignity. Communists don't appreciate the moral significance of this fact about us. Echoing a principle familiar from Immanuel Kant, King insisted, and here I quote, to deprive man of freedom is to relegate him to the status of a thing, rather than elevate him to the status of a person. Man must never be treated as a means to the end of the state, but must always, but, but always as an end within himself. Nonetheless, King praised Marx for being a champion of the poor, the exploited, the dispossessed. He believed communist, the communist movement, whatever his theoretical pronouncements might happen to be, it's actually rooted in an abiding concern for social justice and is itself a protest against that injustice. Communism opposes racism and seeks to realize a classless society. Despite the fundamental flaws in communism, King was adamantly opposed to suppressing it through war. We have to defeat communism, he thought, by ending the injustices it is a response to and is nourished by. Indeed, King insisted there is truth in its collectivist spirit. 
we should seek to unite its concern for community and for the least advantaged with the capitalist valuing of individual rights and free enterprise. King, it's clear, was not an unqualified defender of capitalism. He thought that capitalism not only creates immense economic inequality, but also, as he would say, superfluous wealth and degrading forms of poverty. He condemned the fact that in America, quoting him again, one-tenth of one percent of the population controls almost 50 percent of the wealth. The driving ethos of capitalism makes people indifferent to the suffering of others. Given market dynamics and the centrality of the profit motive, it encourages a win-at-all-cost competitive spirit and narrowly self-interested ambition. It also leads us uh, to evaluate everything, including the worth of other people in terms of commercial values. But Keynes seems to have thought that capitalism could be reformed to avoid these consequences, as he claims, for example, we can work within the framework of our democracy to make for a better distribution of wealth. Although King is, uh, I think, quite radical by today's standards, which isn't saying much, I realize. Um, when, it comes to economic, when it comes to economic justice, it, 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 I think it, it would be misleading to describe him as a, a socialist. Why do I say that? Well, he didn't attack the legitimacy of private ownership of productive assets and natural resources, nor did he argue for the nationalization of finance or industry. He did, of course, call for higher wages for workers and a regulated labor market, but he didn't regard wage labor as inherently exploitative, nor did he demand that all workers be paid the same hourly wage. While in favor of greater workplace democracy and stronger unions, he didn't call for worker cooperatives either. The profit motive, left unconstrained by considerations of justice, can of course be a corrupting influence. And valuing profit over the well-being of persons, he maintained, is immoral. But King didn't condemn for-profit enterprises as such. Um, King is therefore, I think, best described as, say, a liberal egalitarian or a social democrat. His vision was a matter of embracing the best elements from capitalism and socialism, a mixed economy of private and public ownership where wealth and income is equitably shared under democratic self-governance. So let me bring it to a close, King's philosophy in today's ghettos. Now, obviously, deeply disadvantaged black neighborhoods are still with us. We've yet to abolish the ghetto as a socio-spatial site of racial and economic injustice. Discrimination in employment and housing remains a problem. None of King's four principles in economic justice have been fully realized in the United States. There's still enormous poverty in the midst of great and visible opulence. Approximately 15% of Americans live below the federal poverty line, and more than a third of all black children live in poverty. The black unemployment rate is roughly double the white unemployment rate and has been that way for decades, and the jobless rate among the ghetto poor is even higher. The federal minimum wage does not guarantee a full-time worker that a full-time worker can raise a family outside of poverty. Labor organizations will very limited power at the moment as unionization rates are low and right-to-work laws make it even harder for workers to bargain for fair compensation. While technological innovation and productive efficiency have obviously soared since King's death, uh, real wages of the average worker have remained flat. The war on poverty uh, yielded to an attack on welfare as an entitlement. The Personal Responsibility and Work Opportunity Reconciliation Act, 1996, commonly just referred to as welfare reform, abolished unconditional means test income support for poor families. There are now five-year lifetime limits on receiving federal welfare support, and this support is conditional on recipients meeting work requirements. Notwithstanding this contraction of the welfare state, there's no entitlement to public sector jobs for uh, hard-to-employ workers. Under these conditions, I take it that dignity is threatened, and equal citizenship is, at least for many, an abstract right at best. And abolition of ghettos seems like a distant dream. Though many of King's insights, I think, continue to be relevant uh, today, I think uh, uh, a number of them would need to be revised or extended to take account of some developments that have happened since um, his assassination. Now, many you could talk about, I'll just mention three uh, that stand out to me and seem to be particularly far-reaching. And these are the, the shifts in the class structure of black America, the dramatic rise in black single mother families, and changes in the operation of the criminal justice system. 
So let me comment on each of those briefly before I stop. Now, when King was writing, the black professional class was tiny. Um, and most middle class blacks lived in the same communities with working class and poor blacks. Since his assassination, opportunities in higher education has obviously increased. And now there is a large and visible black professional class whose members occupy positions throughout the economy and government. These highly educated blacks uh, earn high incomes and are, they're not confined to ghetto neighborhoods. Uh, there's now a greater concentration of poor people in black communities as many middle class blacks no longer live in black neighborhoods. While some affluent blacks remain committed to the principles of economic justice King espoused, the economic interests of the black elite are not particularly closely aligned with those of the ghetto poor. Black solidarity is much more fragile and, civil, and a civil rights labor alliance much more difficult to cultivate and maintain. So I think really any social movement that's aimed at abolishing ghettos is probably going to have to look quite a bit different from the one that King had in mind, uh, either in terms of its demographics of, uh, of its principal constituents. Since the Moynihan Report, single motherhood has risen among all racial groups, but it's particularly high among blacks. King, like Moynihan, saw black single mother families as dysfunctional, brought about through the economic marginalization of black men. Wouldn't really surprise me if King happened to be somewhat sympathetic to uh, recent efforts to increase marriage rates among blacks and to reduce non-marital births among disadvantaged black women. To be frank, um, he didn't quite address questions of gender inequality with any real sophistication. And he largely viewed the situation of black women and children through a patriarchal lens. However, I would maintain that single motherhood is not inherently dysfunctional. Uh, black single mother families are fragile largely because of the structure of the labor market and limited public support for those who rear children. Because the working day for a full-time worker in America is typically quite long, uh, it's difficult for a working mother to be available to supervise and care for her children um, when they're not at school. Because childcare isn't generally viewed as a valuable contribution to society, the demanding work it involves isn't properly rewarded or recognized. So women who want to be mothers, but perhaps not yet, if ever, ready to be wives, are often economically disadvantaged and have difficulty maintaining a well-functioning household. This is the situation of many black women in ghettos. Rather than push such women into greater dependence on men, Liberal egalitarian policy could reduce the length of the standard workday, increase financial support for parents with young children, and offer publicly funded child care services. When we consider the inescapable web of mutuality, the king often emphasized that, as he would often say, the single garment of destiny, we have to take care, I think, better care than he did to not neglect or subordinate matters of gender inequality. The war on drugs mandatory sentencing laws, and aggressive policing and prosecution, among many other factors, have led to the mass incarceration of black people, particularly poor black people. The incarceration of a loved one makes already disadvantaged black families even more economically insecure. There's not only the possible loss of income during a period of imprisonment, but even after release from prison, a former felon will find it even more difficult to find work in the illicit economy, where it's not illegal to discriminate against those with criminal records. The measures King recommends to reduce unemployment and to guarantee income for those who can't find decent work would have to be extended to those with felony convictions. The black freedom movement would also have to include working to reform the criminal justice system for without rather dramatic changes, I think, uh, in that domain, ghettos are probably going to remain with us for some time. Okay, so what I tried to do in this lecture, well, I've tried to recount King's diagnosis of the ills of ghettos and his proposed remedies. Tried to offer a, a kind of reconstruction of his broader political philosophy that I think sort of undergirds his vision for the second phase of the black freedom struggle. This phase, still far from over, focuses on questions of economic justice, which he regarded as the root of the problems of the ghetto. Now King obviously doesn't have all the answers for our time, nobody does. <laughs> Uh, but I do think we can learn from his approach to ghetto poverty, and I think we can build on it, revising when necessary to address the problems of the ghetto poor today. Thanks for listening. Very much appreciate it. Perhaps came in um, after the general announcement about the layout of the building.
Uh, we're going to keep going through Q&A. If you need the restroom, it's caddy corner. I don't know a considerable number of you, so I'm going to allow Tommy to kind of point and field his own questions unless it gets too awkward. So without further ado, let's go to <laughs> Q&A, and we'll go from there. Oh, you were going to handle this for me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. I'll <laughs> Yes, sure. So, uh, so fairly early on, you talked about the kind of misery that uh, might be experienced in the face of great economic inequality, and um, it made me wonder whether or not, in the economic context, King ever made an argument similar to the one he made in the context of uh, legal segregation in his uh, letter from uh, Birmingham Jail, where he talks about, I was trying to find my notes on it, mm -hmm. uh, character distortion, basically, the way in which the legal, legal segregation both sort of can make both the people who are favored under that system uh, think better of themselves than maybe they should, and the people who are not favored in that system think worse of themselves than maybe they should. And so there's this kind of argument about character distortion in, in that legal segregation case. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if he ever explicitly made the same kind of argument with respect to uh, economic inequality, and that that could also be distorting to the soul and human personality. I'm not sure. Um, I mean, I think that there's clearly a, a parallel argument he's trying to make that has to do with, I mean, in the case of Jim Crow, you have explicit laws that communicate kind of insult and contempt. And uh, that part of the problem with Jim Crow laws is they communicate that some people have um, a lesser moral status than others. Their interests are just less important, their lives are less important than others. Um, and apart from all the other things that go along with Jim Crow, the, uh, the violence, the discrimination, so on, communicating that message uh, is uh, an insult to those who are supposed to be your fellow, your fellow citizens. Um, uh, and it's part of what makes the, the regime illegitimate. So I think there's something analogous going on in the case of poverty, right? Though you don't have necessarily, an, uh, uh, I mean, you, depends on how you want to think about it. You could maybe, if you abstract enough, you could think of, the, of our laws that structure the labor market, the tax scheme, welfare, those laws as in some sense doing the same thing in terms of communicating that some people's interests, those who can't, who can't find a place in the current labor market that will reward their labor enough to bend them up out of poverty, communicating that those people really are, are not, uh, their interests are not as important as others, their interests are, are of, of less value. And so in that, to that extent, I guess it would be analogous, and it could have the same effect of being so corrupting, um, internalized in a certain way. I think in, maybe in some way that's kind of what he has in mind, the, the idea that about why people uh, feel humiliated because they feel like living amongst people who are supposed to be their equals, who clearly by the fact that they allow them to live in this way, um, disregard them as of lesser worth. So it may be analogous in that way, and maybe the, the threat to uh, self-respect, to character, by having that message communicated as you walk a route that your, your city is the same. You know, we could uh, um, we could get a different king out of uh, you know his life than the, the one that, that you want us to have. You know, uh, for instance, and I sort of prefer you know the portrait of king in say uh, Cornel Westburg, the radical king, and then according to him, the king could be read as a you know a democratic socialist, and perhaps in a, uh, going in the direction of even more uh, going in a mo even more radical direction than the word that the democratic. Uh, the, phrase democratic, democratic socialism could contain. And uh, there are a couple of uh, short paragraphs uh, King wrote also about, you know, the, his uh, thoughts about uh, where capitalism was heading. And uh, even though mm -hmm. King never was a Marxist, and he explicitly rejected that the uh, Marx materialist philosophy, he nonetheless accepted that, the, well, that maybe uh, the history was kind of tending toward the direction that mm -hmm. the Marx thought that the, you know, uh, history was going, because mm -hmm. he thought that the, well, maybe capitalism has seen its best days, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, capitalism tried desperate tactics, you know, war and, uh, you know, and repression, all kinds of things, you know, trying to hold on to, you know, and its ideal glory days, you know, and, uh, but King thought that that may be failing. And I just thought that the, well, the, the way things are going in the United States right now, maybe we need a, a more radical king than the president of oh, Yeah, <laughs> I thought mine was pretty radical. Okay. Um, so, uh, yeah, I agree. I mean, the, so there are a number of people, uh, Cornel West, Michael Dyson, various people who tried to make an argument. Mostly what they point to, they do point to the, to the, to the comment you, you mentioned about this, the thought of capitalism 
yeah, they're like these little nuggets, if you like, um, but they're not really developed. And in Michael, Eric, yeah, yeah, in Michael Eric Dyson's book on King, which I think quite good, um, sure, he's written two on King. One of them, one of them is uh, uh, it's called I, uh, I mean, I get there with you. Um, he has a long chapter on this, and he admits that like there isn't really in the published material or in the public speeches any real basis for these claims. It's like most of it's rooted in reported conversations he's had with confidants. Um, yeah, but not in. So what I was what we're trying to do in this I mentioned at the beginning of trying doing this book on King's political philosophy is take his his pub, his published writings. I mean, he wrote four books. He wrote, it's a lot of stuff there. A lot of public speeches. Take that material as a basis for trying to uh, understand his broader political philosophy, recognizing that there are things in the letters and the archives and so on that might upset it in some ways. Uh, so I, I'm open to the possibility that maybe that, that one, one will find, one digs down and knows more to, to say in this direction. But he's pretty consistent um, uh, from his very early things to his, late, to, to his late things about the things he said about capitalism. He pretty much says the same thing about it. So, um, so I don't feel entitled to make that stronger claim. Of course, we're not limited to just what he says. So <laughs> we, can, we can always say something, you know, endorse something more radical if we think that's required. I'm gonna try to move move back and move back and forth. Their hands don't move. Are you gonna you keep it? I can't. I, I can barely keep track of it. But so I'm gonna take take your question. Sorry. Okay. I was getting lost in, in thought. I forget the cue. So um, when you were discussing the principles of economic justice, race is largely absent from that discussion entirely. And so my question is whether um, you and your team have a particular position on class differences becoming more egregious in some way or a greater threat to dignity when they coincide with race, or whether it's just coincidental in, in the case what, that he's talking about, not coincidental in the way that it works, but in terms of it, that blacks happen to be on the bottom of the social hierarchy, but the principles of why this is so egregious have nothing to do with race, but truly are about economic inequality. I certainly would never say just a thing, but um, I don't think King thinks, thinks that either. So I think that, um, so I think he thinks, um, there are ongoing racial injustices and racial injustices in the past that impact the present. And it's important to address those things. So I, I, I said that maybe too quickly, but I think he does think that. Uh, I think he also thinks that the labor market, of, uh, the labor market, the labor movement of his time um, was highly discriminatory. Um, and so with, there's no way you could have the kind of civil rights labor coalition he was calling for without pretty big changes in the way that many of these labor organizations operated. So uh, I think race is meant to be a part of the story. I was trying to focus on one piece of it, which is his thought that what has the, 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 the black freedom struggle's long fight against uh, racism and racial discrimination and exclusion, you got to join that with a struggle for economic justice and trying to fill out what that part looks like. But I didn't mean to suggest that somehow, like, we saw all that part, now just this part, but that uh, uh, any movement forward on that front, on the front of racial justice, is also going to have to be involve a movement on um, on the front of economic justice as well. So, sorry if I that was didn't mean to say something so misleading. Justin. That's not, not, yeah, that, right. That's not mm -hmm. going to do it. So, the, so, mm -hmm. so, so then the thought has to be, it's, it's not that they're not living in luxury, it's that there's something specific. 
specific about the conditions that they're living in, which, yeah. which allowing people to live like that right. constitutes a, a failure to, to treat them as having equal worth. And, and I wonder what that might be mm -hmm. exactly. And, and the sort of the, the second part of the question mm -hmm. is the question she was just asking, that is, is, isn't part of the answer that King is going to want to give to that, that maybe it's not just a, a generic picture of poverty as such, but that it is connected with issues about racial justice, that there's something about um, about the connection between uh, between poverty and race that makes it especially plausible to think that there's a failure to uh, to treat people mm -hmm. as possessing it. Yeah, good. Um, so I think he, 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 in the first principle, I think he is very much focused on poverty and not on just on, on relative standing. So I do think he is thinking it's the fact that people are in these conditions, these particularly deplorable conditions, that has to affect the communicating this, this sense of lesser, lesser words. So it's not merely that, you know, if everybody else is like doing pretty fine, but some people are living in the audience, that's not what he's objecting to. He's, so it is, it is very much focused on uh, the, the condition of, of people who are deeply dis disadvantaged. Uh, and I take it that the thought is supposed to be something like, if you know certain very basic facts about how a capitalist economy works, you don't need any complicated understanding of it, you will know that there are going to be some people who might find it very difficult to find a place in that, in that economy uh, that will allow them to live above poverty. And if you know that, you know that, and yet you still let them just like language there, then that suggests something about how you think of them, about your, your and, and so I think I think that's supposed to be the picture. It's supposed to be, um, so you could, that's why I think why he has like an or thing. It's kind of like, well, you could either provide uh, work for them to do so they can make a contribution that would, and, and, and that would bring them up above that, those, those, those conditions, and that would communicate a sense of, the, of equal concern for their interest. Um, or failing that, you could just give them the income because that way you could say, well, look, the fact that you're in this, is, that we know that you're in this position is not because um, of uh, some fault of yours. It's not like well, you've you had all the opportunities in the world, and you just, but because of the way we've decided to structure our economy, you're going to you're finding yourself in a situation. So we give basic income to communicate. Yes, we still value you just as just as anyone else. It just so happens that some people's. Um, uh, uh, skills and abilities are, are more socially valuable, uh, or so, more socially valued by the by the, by the market. Um, so I think he thought it was like those two, doing either of those would be sufficient to communicate a sense of equal standing to everyone. I think that's the way the picture is supposed to go. Um, I don't think he thought you needed the the racial dimension of it to make that out, though clearly you could add it and. Um, Partly because I think he wanted to emphasize that um, uh, the fact that there are many, many, many white people who are poor, uh, and he thought that um, uh, you probably couldn't make it out that way. I mean, maybe you. I mean, you know. I mean, maybe you could say some people say this now um, when they talk about mass incarceration. They might say, um, you know, look, you know, in state prisons around, uh, around the country, you know, uh, more than 30% of the people in them are white. Now, you could say, uh, as some people do, that's just collateral damage. <laughs> We're just trying to, it's really it's directed toward brown people, but, you know, um, uh, that's just collateral damage. Uh, I'm inclined to say it's yes, probably more to it than that. Uh, and I think that's, that's, I would say, the analogous thing in this case, that you, you, you wouldn't want to say that all the many uh, poor whites, that they're just left there because it's, it's, it's contempt toward blacks, and it just turns out that they just, you know, as a side effect of that, that they're, they're left there too. I think that's not very plausible.
Yeah, no, good. Um, I don't think there's inconsistency in the, in the principles, but if you think there are, please tell me so I can be alert to it. <laughs> um, uh, the interpretive thing is difficult. Uh, I, I realize that it's, it's tricky here. So I think there are figures, like if I were trying to give a reconstruction of, of Booker T. Washington's political philosophy, I'd post it very differently. Because I do think that you know, he was very concerned, um, he's very pragmatic, very much a political realist, and so he didn't always say what he thought. Uh, and so you, if you're trying to reconstruct his philosophy, and there are other people like that, you could, that I, would, uh, that I would, wouldn't think you could kind of do what I'm trying to do with King here. I think King's different. I mean, King's, I think, put him more in the category of Du Bois, and as people uh, who, who thought that uh, any fight for justice should be done with the truth, and you should say it openly. Uh, and uh, that he, you know, what he what he said in he wouldn't say anything that he didn't believe in these written things. That doesn't mean he said everything he thought. Of course, uh, I think he probably didn't say everything he thought. But I think everything he said in these publishing, I think he thought. Um, and I think. Part of that's a matter of trying to get a sense of the guy, uh, looking at historical scholarship on him, looking at just reading him, and a sense of like, I think it's a part of, a, of his political ethic that you don't use deception to achieve, achieve justice. There's so much deeply, and I think something similar to be said about Du Bois. So I think that they can be read, even though they are, as you say, public intellectuals, public thinkers, um, trying to create concrete results in the world, not just, you know, um, philosophizing in a seminar room. Um, I do think that they are, they are saying what they think and they're giving their reasons for it. So, so I try to do that. The order of presentation is, is rhetorical. I don't think, it, it didn't, I didn't mean it to, to, to be anything substantial. I just thought like it would be helpful to kind of get a sense of like, you know, Here's a problem. Here's a diagnosis. Here, here's prescriptions. Now, what justifies? I just thought, for presentation purposes, that would be. But I didn't mean to suggest by that that he didn't come to those practical prescriptions by reflection on uh, political principles and about what might justify them. I think he did. Um, uh, so I hope that I hope that clarifies. People disagree on this. I, I do realize. Um, on the question about whether what I'm trying to do here with King can really succeed uh, um, because you can't take things at, at face value, they say. But, um, but I think there are good reasons to think, at least in his case, you, you can. Yes. Um, given your description of these principles, could you speak to any mechanisms that have tried to advance since King is Yeah, I think there are always people trying to. I mean, you mean, you mean like in, in the context of law and sure, I, yeah. I um, I mean, you could argue that. I mean, prior to the '96 welfare reform, um, you know, you did have means-tested. Uh, unconditional poor support, um, uh, and that was, you know, there there was an attack on that and uh, a movement to 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 abolish it, and they succeeded. Uh, so there was, I mean, I think a certain amount of commitment, to that, and a lot of people tried to resist it. A lot of people in the Clinton administration tried to resist it, uh, but they didn't succeed. Um, so I think that there have been forces trying to maintain that or keep that or, you know, 
And, you know, I sort of thought that there might be a possibility, you know, there are many possibilities seem gone now, but they were, they were uh, saying there was a possibility for, for say, say, Hillary Clinton to revive, the, re raise the question 20 years out from that, from, from welfare reform, to re raise the question about was that a good idea. A lot of people who think it wasn't a good idea and it should be changed in lots of different ways in, this, in the direction I think the king would be, would be pushing. Even now, there's, there seems to be a lot of people, or maybe it's just my social, social network, <laughs> a lot of people uh, pushing for uh, unconditional basic income support and trying to make a case for that in light of what we're seeing is a lot of joblessness uh, amongst low-skilled workers across, across races. Um, and people are trying to make the case for that. And there are people, not all of those people are on the left. I think some of those people are, are, are conservative who have find some sympathy for that point of view. And so I think there's a question about wh whether, you, whether you want to continue with the thought, which a lot of people I think find intuitive, which is um, if you have people who are economically disadvantaged and, and need income, you, 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 you make sure their access to that is always mediated by, by work. Uh, usually in the private, uh, private sphere. Um, and I think that's the thing that would have to be called in, in, into question if you're going to make any progress on this. I think there's some people who think that you, you, you we should. Um, and rather than just kind of just expanding the service sector like more and more in that way, um, it'll be better to, 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 to move something. So I do think there are things like that going on. I mean, it's, you know, it is the United States, so, um, you know, you don't... Um, it's hard to, to, to get action in, uh, in Congress in an egalitarian direction, so I wouldn't deny that uh, at all. But, you know, I, I, as a philosopher, I think you've got to take the, the long view. And you have to, uh, I think King also took the long view and also thought, you know, you have to, you, you, you keep putting these things before the public. You keep making these cases before the public, and sometimes circumstances will be more auspicious. I mean, it would be, you know, enable, will enable a possibility. Uh, and, but that won't happen if you're not if you're not putting that putting that view out there and continually defending it, rather than just moving moving further and further away from it, given what the, the zeitgeist. So I continue to think that's the right way to go with it. Yeah. I don't know the full answer. I mean, I do think he, he didn't. I mean, I was trying to suggest that he, he, he could have made a move away from just this sort of well-known strong anti-poverty stance towards something more egalitarian if he were to emphasize the point you just emphasized, that is to emphasize not just that some people don't have adequate means to be able to enjoy their basic liberties and, and opportunities, um, but that they that but that some people have considerably more, which enables them to get much more value out of their their, their basic liberties and opportunities and to exercise it across a broader domain. So I was trying to suggest that that's a, a step he could have taken, though he did not. I don't see that in the in the text. I thought he I think he has a picture of there's a minimal this kind of minimum set of uh, uh, resources that people need to make their basic rights and opportunities more than abstract, to make them really real, to give them the kind of real freedom, as people put it. Um, I don't think he thought it was, uh, I don't see any evidence so far, at least, uh, to suggest that he thought that those need to be equal. I'm not even sure exactly what that would mean, um, to realize that kind of, that, that, that principle. Um, I mean, a more demanding principle. Um, I mean, I suppose, on, just on the question of, like, why allow them um, maybe this is more me than him. Um, I think probably thought you know something like, look, I mean, there there are things you want to encourage people to do. Um, some people do have talents that uh, the uh, that will be if they exercise them, they develop them. 
which is important, how they develop them and exercise them, it would benefit other people. Um, and you might have differential wage scales as one way to encourage those people to make those abilities available. So if you thought that um, uh, it's very important to have people in engineering um, and you wanted those people to go to the trouble to get the kind of education that would be necessary to be able to, you, you might want to hold out to them the possibility of earning somewhat more. That doesn't mean you could justify the kind of differentials that we currently have, but that might be one reason for thinking that it's not incompatible with social justice to have some inequality in wage scales. Uh, I think you thought, that, it seems like you thought that, um, you know, you do want a strong labor union, so, that, so that they're, they're the power of workers who may themselves uh, not have the kinds of skills that the market highly values, um, they could join together with others in order to increase their power to ex ex extract better compensation if they were sufficiently empowered to do so. And he definitely clearly thinks that is an important thing for them to do and it should be allowed to do that. Um, I think there's, I try to indicate some limits there too. I don't know exactly what he would say about what would constitute a fair wage or comp compensation, how we, how we would know what that was exactly. Um, but it does seem like he thought there was such a thing but without committing him to the stronger claim. I mean, if, if, if you thought everybody should be paid the same, then you don't really need to go, go through that, right? I mean, I mean, of worrying about labor unions and their power and so on. So I think that's, that's vague, but I think that's roughly the character or position that he has. I don't know his views, actually, um, about that. So I can't speak to it directly. I mean, he certainly cons pretty consistently is critical of um, the fact that some, some, of the, some of the schools that are available uh, to black people and poor people uh, are inadequate. Um, and that seemed to be the principal focus you see, is the sense that like, we're just not really investing in the education of everyone. But I don't, I don't discern a kind of a developed view around, uh, uh, if you like, educational justice. But, you know, to be honest, I, I haven't read him looking just for that. And maybe if I did, I would see more there than I, than I, than I have so, so far. So sorry, I can't speak to it more. But I, yeah. Yes. I don't know if it's a direct link to, to, to the question of cap capitalism versus socialism, but he certainly addressed the, 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 the idea that um, uh, the, the racial and economic justices of the past need to be offset or otherwise you know, corrected and, and as he sometimes says atoned for, he even says that as early as why we can't wait, um, that uh, you know, there are some compensatory justice claims as he thought that were valid, uh, and he also thought, you know, and I think Johnson, you know, later, you know, I think basically articulated the same position of the necessity of offsetting historically inherited handicaps. Uh, uh, otherwise, you know, in the market economy, you're going to have some people who are very dis disadvantaged because of intergenerational wealth transfers and how that works. So he, he clearly thought you would need to, uh, in one way or another, offset those, dis those, those disadvantages created by by, by, by past injustices, whether that's in the form of straightforward compensatory justice or more forward-looking kind of attempts to create uh, a, a, a fair opportunity uh, structure. That is sort of making it the case that some people, uh, how to put it, um, eliminating the situation where people who are, who are born to great wealth have like tremendously more 
be better life prospects than, than, than others. That was clearly a thing he was very um, concerned about, both backward-looking and forward-looking, if you, if, if you like. And that, that's, that's a part of the picture. out what the picture of dignity is here and why, for instance, my dignity should be imperiled by the fact that others enjoy a life of luxury. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess connected to it, I'm thinking of in your remarks about the kind of 1996 reforms and how other groups have reacted to mm -hmm. this, uh, these sets of reforms. So essentially, it seems to me, uh, mm -hmm. in a nutshell, you know, the uh, calling card of those reforms was uh, the deification of personal responsibility. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I, I got to believe that King on dignity and King on personal responsibility is something that he, he spent some time on. And mm -hmm. I just wondered if you'd say a few words about that and how, mm -hmm. as it were, your personal, your sense of responsibility and dignity could have been impugned by circumstances, whether it's luxury or trauma or what happened. Mm -hmm. Um, I think he doesn't, he uses, uh, in the volume that I'm editing, one of the contributors, Jerry Darby, sort of identifies there. He doesn't always use dignity to mean exactly the same thing. So I was picking out one, one piece of it. Sometimes, uh, um, he, use, he uses the word dignity to mean something like some people might call self-respect, and that's slightly different. So in the case I was thinking of, I was thinking of cases where um, it's a matter of one's sense of, equal standing with others that's being uh, threatened by the fact that some are, are allowed to languish in, in, in poverty while, while others are in great luxury. And uh, so that, I think the thought was supposed to be th there is that if you think that part of what a just society uh, will exhibit is a sense that uh, of of mutual concern amongst equals, that, that each person's uh, life is of, of the, the same value, uh, that you wouldn't have a situation where some people's lives are, uh, are where they're living um, in such humiliating forms of, of, of poverty. The thought is supposed to be uh, in a true democracy, there is that kind of sense of equal civic standing, and that's instantiated in the way the society is organized. Right? Um, and so I think the thought is supposed to be, the first step I think is supposed to be easy, which is uh, the, the presence of the opulence suggests the, that there is the capacity. So it's not just a matter of like, we can't do anything about it. Um, and then the second part, of it is supposed to be, here I'm trying to extrapolate from things he says, um, that has to do with certain things that we understand about the, about the kind of economy that we have. And it's supposed to be relatively straightforward in the thought that um, you, don't need, you, you, you don't need to know much to know that a, a dynamic capitalist economy is, is, is going to push some people uh, out, out of work. Um, and sometimes things can go where skills that people had are no longer really valued and so on. Like these are things that are kind of ordinarily we understand about, about the way it works. And so knowing that and knowing that there are people who, not because they weren't willing to work, as it were, uh, find themselves in poverty, allowing them to stay there suggests something about, I mean, that is in terms of how you structure things, so something about uh, how their lives are valued. So I think that's the way it's supposed to go. I think in the case of welfare reform, the background assumption is that uh, people could find work that pays a living wage if they tried. Right. I mean, there's an yeah. epistemic problem here. Yeah. Of finding out that those who are willing to work and finding out, I mean, on, on this side of the critique we go, there are those who are willing to work and perhaps there are those who aren't. Yeah. Um, and we're not, you know, how do you, how do you solve for that epistemic problem? Right. Right. 
Well, I don't know. I mean, I, I think he thought that even uh, he, he initially would emphasize the willing to work in his earlier writings. As time goes on, that seems to drop out. Yeah. <laughs> um, why, why does it drop out? Um, um, I have my own views about how I would think about it. <laughs> but uh, um, I think for him, um, I do think it is, it, it has to do with a picture of how to put it, a, a diagnosis of the way that capitalism works in the U.S. I don't think that it was, I don't think he has the view that some people have, which is um, you know, like Philippe von Paris or the other people who thinks like, it, the fact that someone is not willing to work uh, uh, does not mean that they're not entitled to support above the poverty line. Um, I don't see King say that directly. Um, I believe this to be true, but <laughs> I myself I think that. But I think um, I don't see him say that directly. What I see him say instead is, um, look, there are people who who are willing to work, but they can't find a work. They can't find work that's not menial and stigmatizing, insecure, and so on. It's going to bring them up to to a living wage, and that is why they do it. Which is weaker claim than that than that stronger thing. I think that's how he he thinks of it. So maybe it does sort of turn on a, a contentious view about uh, the American economy and about what what kinds of jobs are available. I, I, I think it does for him. That is turn on that. I don't know if when you want when you want to stop. I'll let you tell me when. Uh, we'll go a few more minutes. I say two more half. Three more questions now. We'll see. <laughs> no, it's all right. You um, next year will be 50 years since the assassination of King. In these past 50 years, we've seen a homogenization, I call it, of his principles and praxis. Um, have you finished reading or writing the seventh chapter yet? And if not, uh, I encourage you to push forward on some really strong analysis of what those past 50 years have meant. And where we need to go, like his equalitarianism, you, you've declared him not a socialist, not a capitalist, but where is he at in this, you know, in this present context, and how, how are you trying to develop that theory and that, that thought um, in the seventh chapter or seventh point of your book and uh, research? Well, maybe you've already finished it, I don't know. But. Um, you mean like my own book on, on, on ghetto poverty? Yeah. Yeah, so I, oh, that book's done. So I, <laughs> available in your bookstores? Um, uh, so Dark Ghettos, I did finish it. So I, uh, uh, I say somewhat rather different things about work than that he does. Um, but I don't want to take a while to kind of <laughs> try, to, try to develop it. Um, uh, so I don't think about, about it quite the same way because I don't, I don't think that... Uh, uh, a, a living wage, conditional uh, willingness to work, uh, uh, is, is is a is, is a principle of economic justice that we should endorse. So I try to to say over thirty pages about well, that. So um, um, trying to find a useful way to kind of go at your question because it's like there's like. Many things you could say <laughs> about ways of developing his thoughts. I tried to suggest some of the ways that one would want to develop it, and much that one would have to say about how to think about families. I tried to say something about that in the book as well, uh, and about the kind of uh, you know treating um, nuclear family as 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 normative and setting and setting and setting. Uh, People's economic entitlements on the basis of that of that model. I think you'd have to challenge that, and I try to in 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 the book as well. Um, in the King volume that I'm currently working on, people have been assigned various parts of of King's philosophy to try to like delve in deeper. I'm just focusing on this one piece, and there are people who have things to say about about democracy and about love and community and all the various. He has lots of thoughts. Uh, and I, I was only trying to focus on just this one piece that I think most people are not really familiar with. Uh, 
uh, it'll stop. I'm going to take A, and then, I don't know your name, Chris. Yeah. So A, then Chris, then we'll finish with Andy, and that'll be it. Just a, a question about the principles of economic justice, and I, I guess when I was listening to the paper, I was just thinking, oh yeah, well, this is, these are principles that govern how, uh, you know, within a, a, a country or nation, yeah. uh, but then it just occurred to me, well, actually, are, are they uh, much more universal than that? So, like, the, the mm. kinds of obligations that yeah. are kind of listed here would extend to How were you intending those? I was, in, I was intending them to be focusing on, on domestic justice, but King certainly thought that they extended. I mean, that's a much more complicated argument to make. I don't think he actually develops it, but I think he, he you know, his conception, I mean, he always used to say, you know, that, um, you know, three great evils, right, are, are, are you know, um, racism, poverty, and war. Um, and, he, and he always thought of that as, a, like, these are global problems and so I think a lot of his the emphasis on anti-poverty principles are meant to take in the globe uh, um, you know I was focusing on 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 this one part to kind of make sense of his ideas uh, about uh, black urban poverty as he develops them and like why he thought what he thought about them relying on relying on his principles I don't think that the views uh, on um, on global justice are that well developed. Um, and I think you'd have to say something more complicated than I see in his work to kind of, to kind of make it fully forceful. Um, uh, I mean, you'd have to say much more about colonialism and conquest and war than I, um, and, and implications of that. Uh, uh, and it is more complicated when you're thinking when when you're when you don't have uh, uh, there's no global tax structure, <laughs> so you don't. It's very you know it's a very different set of implications. I don't think he has that really laid out, so I don't try to like, extend it. But I think you're right. He certainly thought that they extended, but I think to to make it to to lay it all out, I don't see all all those pieces in in, in place. So I don't didn't go for big game if you like. <laughs> Yeah, you talk about the social determinants, the marginalization of the African American male, the breakdown of the nuclear family, uh, a lot of the, the war on mm -hmm. drugs that occurred much after uh, Martin Luther King's death. Um, what do you think his issues, or what do you think we policies we need to go forward or support or what do you think on the social uh, uh, determinants uh, from his point? Yeah, I mean, the one I, I, I don't, I've I only, sketched it, but I, I do think that a lot of what he wants, I mean, the big change, um, just take the criminal justice for a second, you know, you know, I mean, I think, doing his, I, have, I should have checked the numbers before I came. Um, my sense is that from his time to now, we're talking about like a tenfold increase of people in, in prison, but even setting that aside, you also have just the large number of people who might not be in prison but have been and have felony convictions. We're talking about big, big numbers. Um, I don't think I, you can make a lot of progress on questions of black urban poverty if you don't have some policies directed towards the people who are former felons. So I, I think. So I was trying to suggest that you, you could extend some of the things that he wants to say about work there, about what it would mean to um, uh, incorporate those persons, integrate them back into the economy, but in a way that they're not only in the most exploitative and stigmatizing jobs, right, that they have opportunities for advancement. I think he'd have to do that, and that would require, obviously, uh, a lot of policy interventions to make that happen. How much of that you could do, you do some of it through public sector work, you do some of it through subsidies to, uh, to, to private firms to hire, to hire people and so on. You could do some of it and I think it's slightly more complicated what to do about whether to make people's felony convictions public knowledge. That's a controversial thing that some people think we should stop doing. Um, as soon as I have anything to say about that. And so, but those are the kinds of things I think one would have to, to do 
uh, to go forward. Um, that's just one example. But I think you, you could extend. I, I, you you could extend some of the things he wants to say about. Like I don't think the picture he has of of what to do about poor families. You can't extend it as is um, because he has a. He still has a. He, you know, man, it's hard. I mean, people. He basically agreed with Monaghan. I mean, I realize that's not that that's considered heresy, but I think he basically agrees with him that uh, the marginalization of black families and the fact that there are a, a, a lot of, of single mother families is, is, has to do with the economic marginalization of black men. And so finding ways of, of integrating them into the economy would shore up the family. I myself, I, I, like I say, I don't think there's anything wrong with a single parent family. So I don't think there's anything to be exactly shored up in that, in that way. And so you'd have to say something very different than what he says and kind of just extend it just the way he has it. Um, but those are the directions I think you have to, to, to go in if you wanted to kind of implement these, these thoughts. Right. That's a good question. Um, I don't know the answer to it. Um, it's it's hard to know what to do. I mean, it would be there could be many cases of what, whether illness or disability, other kinds of things that uh, might make it the case that the person can't exercise all the freedoms, take advantage of all the opportunities that others have. Um, perhaps he would. I'm extrapolating again. Um, think that those cases um, uh, don't fall under the economic justice questions that he's, the economic justice concerns that he has, maybe things that they have to be dealt with differently. Um, but I'm not certain. He doesn't address it directly as far as I know about what to do with, I mean, I take it the issue is something like there might be people in order for them to really exercise all the same liberties to take advantage of all the opportunities that others have, you'd have to throw enormous resources at it. Uh, uh, but, but the fact that there, you, that there are going to be some cases where there are no minor resources you could throw at it that would, would, would enable them to, to do it suggests you can't quite think that, right? I mean, because you are going to have cases where people, their, their functioning is sufficiently low that there's nothing you could do in terms of resources that would make it possible for them to enjoy all the freedoms that others have. So I suspect that, that he, he can't just incorporate that into what he has in mind. So he'd have to have something to say differently about the cases of severe disability or illness. Uh, and maybe those constitute exceptions to, to the principles. But, I, but again, I, I don't see him say directly on uh, uh, anything about that, uh, about that point. Am I speaking to the concern? Maybe I'm not sure. I mean, I, I took it that it was a, the distinction you're trying to make is between um, not abstract individuals or something, but more um, the idea that they're like, like merely formal rights uh, and, and 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 rights that people can uh, uh, effectively exercise, uh, something like that. And the thought was that you know, just sort of saying 
um, you, have, you have freedom of association. And so therefore, you can live um, uh, in a community with whatever demographics that you, you know, something like that. Like, that is, is sort of like a meaningless thing he thought, right, if you don't really have any means. Um, or as, you know, uh, uh, he, I think one of the places that he and, and Malcolm X think would agree, uh, uh, like even when it comes to like segregation in like uh, uh, a restaurant, say, um, uh, that just, 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 just sort of saying you are free to eat wherever you want, and I cannot, you know, but you have no means, you know, that that's not, that's not really to enjoy the, 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 the full privileges that others have. I think that's the kind of picture that he, that he has. Um, I mean, my, I myself am more, you know, more inclined to think of this in, in the way that, that John Rawls does, so that I think that, that there's something like, a, a, you know, the fair value of one's political liberties, but that's, but that's relational in some sense, right? I mean, it's, um, how to put it? Um, we have certain political liberties that have to do with freedom of, 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 of assembly. You can, you can run for office, you can vote, you can do these various things. Um, and, I, and I think there's, there is something to be said for people do need adequate means and leisure to be able to fully exercise those liberties and that that's a requirement of having equal standing. I'm not sure uh, whether um, you could extend that rather strict and, and demanding principle to all opportunities that are available to people. Uh, but that's a more contentious thing and, um, and, and certainly beyond anything that King actually addresses. Let's thank Tommy. There's a reception. You can uh, join us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.